In May of 1961, President Kennedy, to a joint session of Congress, shared the following challenge for the United States. He said that we are to commit ourselves to the achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. This week, on Wednesday, marked the 55th anniversary of the fulfillment of that commitment. But he amplified that commitment about a year later, in September of 1962, in Houston, Texas, at Rice University, and this is what he said. But why, some say, the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win, and the others too. Being a Christian in 2024 in the United States of America is certainly not easy. But we are called to do the things that are hard and to do the things that are right. And we must intend to win for the Lord Jesus Christ in doing so. Of course, we do all of this not to bring honor and glory to ourselves. But Psalm 115 verse 1 says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. If you have your Bibles, please turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2 with me. And as you do this evening, I want to share four things that we can learn from the Apollo space program about doing the hard things and winning for Christ today. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things thou hast heard of me among many witnesses... The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Let's pray. Lord God, we do thank you so much that you have sent us to the United States of America in 2024. We realize that the challenges are hard. But we ask and pray, Lord, that you would help us to endure, help us to serve you faithfully, and help us to win for the cause of Christ here in this land, because this land and the people here so desperately need it. Please be with this message and be with the service throughout this evening and on Sunday as well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Point number one, what do we learn from the Apollo space mission? We remember that we were carefully created and designed. Astronaut William Anders passed away a couple of months ago at the age of 90. He is best known for taking one of the most iconic pictures in human history. On Apollo 8, on Christmas Eve in 1968, of the Earth rising over the horizon of the moon. They were on live TV at that moment when he took that picture, and it was the most watched television program in human history at that point. And they were so awestruck at what they saw, realizing that God was so big and they were so small, that not only did Anders take that picture, but those astronauts didn't know what to say. They were so overwhelmed on live TV. They were going viral at the time, back in 1968. And they decided the only thing that could even describe or come close, what they were seeing was to read in a King James Bible, Genesis 1, 1 through 10, of course, starting with, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. No one, by the way, in 1968 shuddered at that thought, but sometimes in today's day and age, we do. But they firmly believed that what they saw was so marvelous that the only way they could describe it was to read from God's word and describe the creation order that he so vividly and firmly established. And we don't, do know in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. We know that we are created. Sometimes we forget that in this world. The society sometimes sees things totally different than that. 
But that is the truth. Mark 10, 6. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. The psalmist had this to say in Psalm 139, 13 and 14. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. We are created. Those astronauts knew that they were created. They also knew that we are designed individually, tailor-made by God himself. On June 3rd, 1980, the world almost ended. That there, deep in the Colorado mountains, the radar screens saw two inbound missiles from the Soviet Union. And then a few moments later, it displayed 20. And a few moments later, it displayed 200. And a few moments later, 2,000. At that moment, the codes were being sent to the nuclear silos to prepare to launch. Bomber crews were scrambling to their planes. And then all of a sudden, those missiles disappeared from the screens. And no missiles ever struck the United States. The exact same thing happened three days later. And the engineers there at NORAD were trying to figure out what happened. And they troubleshot all of the systems and all of the code and all of the computer and found out that one single 46 cent chip was malfunctioning. One small little 46 cent chip. And when it malfunctioned, instead of displaying a zero, displayed a two. And every time the code went back through, it increased in an order of magnitude to 20, and to 200, and to 2,000. One single 46 cent chip was all that it took to display these missiles that were inbound. Sometimes it's easy for us to believe that we're just 46 cent chips, that we don't really matter, that we can't really be an important part of God's magnificent plan. But that story reminds us that even the 46 cent chips, or maybe especially the 46 cent chips, matter a whole lot. Because God has designed each of us in a very special way to fit together as a part of his magnificent plan. I love reading the truth about God's design. Jeremiah 1.5, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. You know, before you were even born, when you were being formed in your mother's womb, when I was being formed in my mother's womb, God had a plan for you and he had a plan for me. But it's even more magnificent than that. 2 Timothy 1 verse 9, who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. That God had a plan for you and me as 46 cent chips before we were even born and even more magnificently before the world began. And he designed you and he designed me and those Apollo 8 astronauts knew it, which is why they referred back to Genesis 1. And as we are here striving to do the tough things in American 2024, that we can do the hard things and we can win by remember that we were carefully created and designed by God. Point number two, we're to remember to prioritize and connect to the source of our power. On the 20th of July, 1969, when the lunar lander landed on the surface of the moon, there were two astronauts on board that lunar lander, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. And Buzz Aldrin had a plan about what he was gonna do at the very beginning of his time there on the surface of the moon. He said this, Houston, this is Eagle. This is the lunar module pilot speaking. I would like to request a few moments of silence. And I would like to invite each person listening in, whoever or wherever he may be, to contemplate for a moment the events of the last few hours and to give thanks in his own individual way. And then 200,000 miles from home, according to a plan that he had agreed to with his Presbyterian pastor, he took the Lord's Supper there as the first act on the surface of the moon. He went on when asked about it to say this, it was my hope that people would keep the whole event in their minds and see beyond the minor details and technical achievements, a deeper meaning, a challenge, and the human need to explore whatever is above us, below us, or out there. He emphasized that some of the first words spoken on the moon 
were the words of Jesus Christ who made the earth and the moon. There was a million things that Buzz Aldrin needed to do at that moment. And he didn't know if that craft would be able to launch safely at the end of their mission back to the command module that was orbiting the moon. More on that in point three. But he knew that the best thing that he could do was to honor the Lord by taking the Lord's Supper. We're to always remember that God is supreme. Romans 13 verse 1, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be ordained are of God. And of course, we're to prioritize him, Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That means seek him first when you're on the surface of the moon, or when you're commuting to work, or when you're in the grocery store, or wherever you may be, God is directing us like he clearly had spoken to Buzz Aldrin to put him as the priority. Turn to Romans chapter 8, if you would, Romans chapter 8. And as you do so, we're to ponder his magnificence and his love. Psalm 8, 3 and 4. When I consider thy heavens and the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? And while it is true that it is inconceivable that God would even consider us we find out in Romans 8 and so many other places in God's word how much he loves us. And I had the privilege back after a horrific F-22 crash in 2009 to read these words at a very populated memorial service for one of my heroes, Dave Cools Cooley. And it's important then at a memorial service, but today in this service, and it all points to remember that God's love to you and to me is unending. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And then he starts to answer in verse 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And we're to stay connected to him. When I was here last year, and it's always an honor to be here, I'm here with my daughter, Summer, this time around. She is a budding pilot to be for the United States Air Force. I so appreciate the Kumars for hosting us. But when I was here, I talked a little bit last year about John 15, 5. And I'd like to read that to you. I am the vine, you are the branches, Jesus tells us. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. What a stark contrast that if we stay connected to him as the source of our power, then we can do great things that will last and have meaning and provide joy and purpose in our lives. But if we do not, then we can do nothing that will last or nothing that will truly matter And as we think about 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. When we remember that we are to prioritize and connect to the source of our power, then we can do hard things and win for Christ here in our society in the United States of America or wherever you may be around the world, even in 2024. And that lesson we learned from Apollo 11 and Buzz Aldrin. Point number three, if we're going to do the hard things and win today, then we're to remember the power of fellowship and unity. While Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong drifted down to the surface of the moon, there was a third astronaut on that mission, Michael Collins. And he stayed with the command module orbiting the moon, waiting for his compatriots to eventually rejoin about 24 hours after they left him. And every rotation around the moon, he was on the backside of the moon, separated from all of humanity for 48 minutes. And this is what was said about him. He said this, if a count were taken, the score would be three billion plus two on the other side of the moon and one plus who knows what on this side. He was separated from everybody including his two astronaut compatriots who were on the Earth side of the moon, 48 minutes of every revolution around the moon. 
It was said about him at that moment that not since Adam has any human known such solitude. What an amazing experience. We think about Buzz and we think about Neil, but Michael Collins was there not knowing if he was going to have to return home without those two, eventually, if they never were able to take off and rejoin. And every revolution, alone with his thoughts on the other side of the moon for 48 minutes. Genesis 2, 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. Michael Collins certainly realized that as he rotated around the moon. And as we serve together in this very challenging circumstance, in a world that seems so bent on separating itself from God, that we are to prioritize church and prioritize fellow believers. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Galatians 6.10, as we have therefore opportunities, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Or John 15.35, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. What a great reminder, hearkening back to Michael Collins, that we have this body of believers and an automatic connection whether I live in Washington, D.C., and you live here in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, that there is a natural connection between us that is unmatched among humans, and we have a connection, and we must cultivate that connection as much as we can. And we're to seek fellowship and unity. Acts 2, 46 and 47. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. There is a great lesson on this topic from George Washington, from a note that he wrote called a general order as they settled in at Valley Forge on the 17th of December, 1777. It's a two paragraph note to the 12,000 men who were there as a part of the revolutionary army. And if you hearken back to American history at that point, we had been fighting the Revolutionary War for two and a half years, since Lexington and Concord on April 19th, 1775, and we had seen zero large-scale victories against the British. There had been skirmishes, and we had seen success in Concord and Lexington and Dorchester Heights and Trenton and Princeton, but we hadn't seen a large-scale force victory. And Washington knew that if they were gonna have any hope of securing, securing liberty, then they needed to stay together as a professional force and grow together in discipline and skill during the long, cold, harsh winter of 1777 to 1778. And so on the first day in the camp, he wrote a two paragraph letter called the General Order. One of the best series of leadership lessons you could ever read, I would commend you to read that. And the first paragraph is filled with leadership lessons. And then the short paragraph, that follows the second paragraph is phenomenal in a different way because he then declares the next full day in camp, December 18th, 1777, in the midst of all of the things that they had to do. If you remember Valley Forge, it was freezing. The camp was characterized by bloody footprints on the snow because they didn't even have footwear, that they had shelter to build and food to forage and weapons to fabricate but instead, Washington says in the first full day in camp that they are to get together and prioritize praise and worship and prayer and fellowship because he knew the only way they were going to survive is through God's blessings and by the togetherness of the 12,000 people that were a part of that community. We are to realize that we must prioritize fellowship and unity. One of my favorite recent, recent devotionals was a book that I read called Strength for Service that was given to servicemen during World War II, written each devotion by pastors around the country. Richard Spann wrote the following, one cannot measure manpower by counting troops or laborers in the factory or the, even the members on a church roll. Statistics can't record all of the resources. Scripture says that under certain conditions, one shall chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight. 
and may not always be wise to insist on these proportions, he says, but the principle is everlastingly valid. The physical strength of a man must always be added to the strength of his soul, his power for marshalling the resources of truth, righteousness, and love. When armed with these, man finds himself working together with God and time, regardless of the mere manpower operating to the contrary. That we may not be a large body of believers compared to the masses that are out there, but it is not a simple calculation that is based on mere manpower, but it is us doing right and doing the hard things and striving together that gives us the strength enabled by God to do the things that God would call us to do here in the United States of America in 2024. We are to remember the power of fellowship and unity, and when we do, we can do the hard things and win for Christ. And finally, point number four, we're to remember our roles as ambassadors in this foreign land. On the 24th of July, 1969, is when those astronauts landed back on Earth fulfilling Kennedy's challenge from May of 1961. But the astronauts, though they were back on Earth, were not actually yet truly back home and integrated back into human society. Of course, they landed in the Pacific Ocean and they got picked up by an aircraft carrier via helicopter and transported back to the United States. But that wasn't the totality of their journey. They had to spend 21 days in a mobile quarantine facility, carefully observed by doctors to make sure they didn't bring back a lunar pathogen that would destroy humanity. That they didn't know that based on their time on the surface of the moon, that they possibly could bring back something that would kill all of us. And so they studied them for 21 days, basically locked in a capsule together as doctors looked on through the window from the outside. They were essentially treated as foreigners to planet Earth until they were proven innocent because they were assumed guilty for those 21 days. It's important for us to remember that in a lot of ways, like those three astronauts, that we truly are foreigners here on this land, that God has sent us here. Our home is in heaven. We are to put our affection on those things that are above and remember that we are here as Christ's ambassadors in this foreign land that truly does seem so much more foreign than the things that we understand from the truths of God's word. 2 Corinthians 5.20, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's deed, be you reconciled to God. And we must always remember that we represent the one who sent us, not the place where we live. We always represent the one who sent us, not the place where we live. And in doing so, of course, we're to avoid those pathogens that exist all around us. 1 Peter 2.11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against your soul. We're to realize that sin is warring against our soul and that we are to avoid at all costs those pathogens that could cause wholesale destruction to our testimonies and to those that we have been sent to represent and to help understand the truth of our homeland and the one who sent us. As we do that, we're to honor the one constantly who did send us. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above, not on the things of this earth. Or Colossians 3, 17. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And then, of course, we are to reflect as his representatives and his ambassadors, his glory and not our own, and help this world that lives in darkness see the source of light that is provided to us all of the hope that we so steadfastly grasp unto in this world that has forgotten him. Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And I love looking back to those that were sent here that demonstrated to us in their foreign lands how to be an ambassador for the Lord himself. Joseph, Joseph was, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were. I spent 
14 months, fairly recently deployed as our nation's senior defense official to Iraq, about 30 miles away from Babylon. And I spent a lot of time thinking about those four teenagers, maybe 17 years old, as estimated by experts, and the type of impact that they had on their foreign land there in Babylon as they were taken from their homeland. And how many lessons there are for us as ambassadors for Christ, whether we are 17 or younger or older than that, in this foreign land in which we live. And we see in Hebrews, example after example of those individuals that frankly were just normal individuals like you and me, maybe 46 cent parts. But yet, they were able to make an oversized impact by faith in representing the Lord in everything they did. And it's so important for us to realize that in this world that is so different maybe than you and different than me, that people are watching. And what they see determines what they think about what we represent. Let me say that again. People are watching. And what they see determines what they think about what we represent. We are to be ambassadors for Christ. And when we are, we can do the hard things and win for Christ, even in this very challenging and difficult land. And I hope that as you consider those four lessons from those Apollo missions that culminated the president's promise 55 years ago this past Wednesday, that we can remember that we were carefully created and designed. We learned that from Apollo 8 and their reading on Christmas Eve of Genesis 1. We remember that we are to prioritize and connect to the source of our power. We learn that from Buzz Aldrin taking the Lord's table on the surface of the moon as his first act. We remember the power of fellowship and unity and thinking about Michael Collins orbiting the moon and every rotation or revolution, 48 minutes alone, separated from humanity. It's not good. And then we remember our roles as ambassadors in a foreign land in the mobile quarantine facility. And as I close, I think it's important to remember the context of the success of Apollo 11 55 years ago this week in a world that wasn't at peace. It was 1969. And as you go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. That year, we lost 11,000 good soldiers of our country in Vietnam. And you think about the turbulence and you think about the chaos, and you think about when those astronauts set foot on the moon, that it was a defining characteristic of the American experience that in all other ways was the exact opposite of pride and peace and common success for all of humanity. And protests were raging on college campuses, and things seemed dark for our nation, but yet they succeeded and they provide us lessons that we can use as a stark contrast to the turbulence that exists in this world by giving them hope and giving them an opportunity to understand the reason for the hope that is in us in the midst of prevailing darkness that swirls all around us. And then 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. No man that worth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We're to endure hardness in a challenging context in America in 2024. But we are to be good soldiers for Jesus. And we're to take these lessons from the Apollo missions. And we are to please him who has chosen us to be a soldier. Not those that we see in the Hall of Fame of Faith, but those that I see in this room that God has called and God has charged for this time, for such a time as this. And I hope that as you endure the hardness of this world, that you realize that we can win for the cause of Christ by following these thoughts from the Apollo mission from 1968 and 1969. Pastor.